All right, folks, welcome back to sociology. Um, today we're going to talk about research. And uh, wow, what a really important uh, topic uh, under the current situation with the coronavirus and the pandemic. And you may be asking, well, what does research in sociology have to do with the pandemic and COVID-19? Well, I think you'll get a sense of that uh, after we go through this part of chapter one. So, um, and really even at the outset here, I'm showing you the scientific method. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is I pulled this particular graphic um, from um, a graphic I saw in an elementary school classroom several years ago. And I found it interesting that, um, and I mean, this isn't um, new, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, but we teach the scientific method as early as elementary school. And what is the scientific method? You know, basically the scientific method is you have an idea about something, and how do you verify its accuracy? Is it the truth or is it not? You know, and, and, and even there, you could think about the pandemic. You know, people's ideas about wearing masks or getting a vaccine and all of that. Um, it's one thing to have an idea about something, it's another thing for it to be accurate. And, you know, as we've witnessed in the pandemic, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of disinformation. And that can sometimes be quite dangerous. Well, what does research have to do with the field of sociology? Well, we have ideas about how society functions and how people act and how people think and those kinds of things, but how do we know that that's true? And that's where research comes into play, okay? So there are two uh, primary methods of research in sociology that we wanna talk about, and that's called the quantitative and qualitative methods of research. If you look at the word quantitative here, you'll see the root word quantity. And quantitative research in sociology is really based on the use of surveys. And the most um, recognizable survey in, in our society that we conduct was just conducted in uh, 2020, uh, the census survey. And that's an example of quantitative research. Surveys allow us to get a lot of information from a lot of people. Uh, we can construct them in the form of paper or digital and get those in the hands of people and we collect that data. You know, and, that, and the census survey is the only survey of its type where it's designed to get information from everybody in a population. That's a pretty significant undertaking to do. Now, the bad part about doing surveys is that when it's, it's written out, it is what it is. You can't change that. And there's only certain kinds of information you're gonna get back from people. You might be able to get a lot of information, but you may miss out on, on some subtleties. And that's where qualitative research comes into play. If you look at the word qualitative, you see the root word quality. So qualitative research is oftentimes participant observation. It is um, uh, small groups, focus groups. And qualitative research allows us to kind of do more detail-oriented research. Now, it's difficult to do interviews, focus groups, participate with people and observe behavior in a large scale. So oftentimes, qualitative research is done with smaller numbers of people, but we get more detailed information, okay? So we're gonna walk through a couple slides here. Some things that we're gonna look at um, over the course of the semester are statistics. And if you've had a statistics course, you'll be uh, a little bit familiar with the kinds of things that we're gonna be looking at. Um, but even if you have not had a, st a statistics course, you probably are familiar with averages. And so we'll be looking at a lot of averages over the course of the semester. Really once we st uh, get into the chapter on crime, from then on we look at a lot of percentages about things, okay? But Descriptive statistics, the, uh, I mentioned averages, that's what the mean is. 
Sometimes we'll look at the median, not going to spend much time on the mode. But averages tell us in a population of people generally what is going on. Now, we always got to be careful with statistics. And we have to be careful that the statistics are actually measuring what we want to see. So, for example, an average can sometimes have people on one extreme and people on the other extreme and the average comes, down, comes out to be something in the middle. Well, in this case, the average is not all that accurate. What's really going on is you've got a lot of people up here and a lot of people down here, and when you average those, it looks like everybody's close to the middle, but they're not. So, yes, we always have to be mindful of research, and we all, always have to be mindful of data. There's lots of questions that we need to have answered when it comes to data. And so that is something that we're going to explore over the course of the semester. Move my picture over just a little bit there. All right. Um, how reliable is the data? And that's kind of what I'm speaking to you right now. Uh, how valid is it? Are we actually measuring what we want to measure? Now, we're not going to get into the weeds on doing research in sociology in an Introduction to Sociology course. I will tell you that just about everything that you see in your textbook, and you've got the three ring binder, but I've got it right here. Just about everything you see in your textbook, your textbook is generally a collection of research, okay? The only bad part about it is a textbook comes out once every few years, so some of the data is a little bit old. So I will be collecting some data to supplement what we talk about from your textbook that uh, is more recent data, okay? But again, how we develop variables, how we develop research studies, just appreciate that in soci sociological research, there's a lot of work that goes in before you even do the research. Because if we don't really you know, dot our I's and cross our T's, if we don't design the, the research project the proper way, then the data that we get is gonna be not good data. It's not gonna be accurate. It's gonna be, you know, in, in some cases, it could be misinformation, okay? So what we do in sociology is far more than just come up with good ideas about things. I, I really try to hold true to that, even in my personal life. If I don't feel really confident in information, I'll say, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. Let me look at some of the best data sources on that topic that I could find before I draw a conclusion, right? And just to go back here again, that's basically what this is. You, know, you have a question about something, you have an idea about something, you know, do we know what the best information is before we draw our conclusions. You know, so sociology has something of value just in everyday life. You know, people are struggling right now with what is the best information about vaccinations and masks. And just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's accurate, and certainly just because it's on Facebook doesn't mean it's accurate, okay? So I mentioned these uh, our major methods of sociological investigation are what you see here. And I would not, I would say not experiments as much as this stuff right here, surveys and participant observation. But even the design of a survey, for example, the census survey, it's, it's funny, the Census Bureau is basically a collection of social scientists, a lot of sociologists. And they do research on how to do the surveys because the, the census survey is incredibly important for a number of reasons. Funding from the federal government to the states and communities, policies, representation. And so that data has got to be accurate, right? So when we do any type of research, the research design, the plan has to be accurate. Um, we have to be careful about um, uh, let me jump to one thing here. It's not in there. Let me see. 
you're going to have a question on, um, well, objectivity is, a, is where I could in, uh, include this in. You're going to have a question uh, on your quiz about overgeneralization. And um, if we're not careful about the design of our research, we could get data that overgeneralizes in terms of male and females, or overgeneralizes in terms of race. So our surveys and our research design has to be an accurate representation of the population by which we are doing research. And so therefore, data we collect from individuals, it has to be randomized and has to be uh, a representation of the population, okay? So, you know, when we do research, you know, we try to be as objective as we possibly can, and that really causes us as uh, researchers in the field to call into question our own value system. We're all human and we have to be careful. You know, for example, let's say you're writing a research paper, which a research paper is quite different than what we're talking about here in terms of research. But when you write a research paper, do you have a preconceived idea about something before you go into writing the research? You gotta be careful of making the research fit your own worldview. You gotta be careful. And so sometimes you have an idea about something, a hypothesis, and you start going and reading the literature and doing the research, and your ideas may have to change because the best information that you're referencing tells you something different about what you thought you know. And that's where learning occurs, right? So sociological research, when it's all done and it's all ready to present, what is it good for? Well. It's good for, in one way, an understanding of how humans behave, how societies operate. But it could also be important in terms of how companies and organizations design their policies and practice to, for their employees, for their customers, for their constituents. It can affect how we think about culture. It can affect how we think about individuals, certain groups of people. So it can really have a lot of impacts depending on what the research is. We do have ethics in our research. Sociologists must be aware that research can harm as well as help subjects and communities, okay? So uh, there are some examples, if you've taken psychology, there's some examples of some research that was done that was deemed to be unethical. Philip Zimbardo's experiment with students in Stanford when uh, he brought together a bunch of students and some of them played guards and some of them played prisoners. You know, it's research studies like that that have caused academic, ac acad academicians, okay, people that work in academics that do research, we have to have our research projects approved by a panel of people to make sure we're, do we're, we're being ethical and, you know, that we're uh, not harming anybody. However, however, sometimes we have to do research with communities of people that are maybe not legal. For example, gangs. Some of the best research that's ever been done is on gang formation and gang behavior. Well, how do we know how gangs function if we don't do the research? But at the same time, in order to embed oneself in a gang, you have to maybe do some things so that the gang members can trust you and so they can be assured that you're not law enforcement. And so sometimes research that we do can, you know, walk a fine line about the ethics of doing research. Okay? So again, that's just a brief introduction to this idea of um, quantitative and qualitative research. All right? And uh, thank you for your attention.